You are listening to Wild About Arizona, the official podcast of the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Wildlife travels across the state constantly, whether they're migrating through or just from one area of the state to another. Wildlife has been moving freely across the landscape for years. Well, then people started putting up fences, adding roadways around the state, interstate freeways even, segmenting animal populations, causing public safety issues with wildlife vehicle collisions on the roadways statewide. So today, we want to talk about connectivity. Hi, I'm Ben Avichugo, and I'm here with Jeff Gagnon, statewide connectivity biologist with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Howdy, Jeff. Welcome back. Thank you, Ben. I know we have some big news to tell, but first, as I understand it, much of your work has to do with habitat fragmentation and wildlife vehicle collision mitigations. What does that mean? And, and how do you do it? So when we're dealing with human population growth in our state and other areas, we tend to see the growth lead to fragmenting of wildlife habitat, which means wildlife that live in certain areas, they get fragmented into smaller and smaller areas. And when they're, when they're in those smaller areas, it can get harder for them to survive. They can't maybe obtain the resources they need, mates, uh, you know, food, water, whatever it may be, make migrations from, you know, summer range to winter range, and it can threaten those wildlife in one way or another. So what we do here in Arizona, our connectivity group kind of tries to deal with some of these issues by addressing those barriers to fragmentation. And that might be something like wildlife crossings like we're going to talk about today, or it might be putting in corridors through developments or, you know, things that allow animals to continue to move as the population growth continues alongside it. As far as the wildlife vehicle collision mitigation, so roads are one of the major barriers to wildlife movements, but they also are a major source of mortality for wildlife. A lot of animals get hit on these roads all over the state and the world for that matter. And it becomes not only an issue for the wildlife populations, but for the drivers as well. It becomes a safety concern. So if you're driving down the road and you hit an elk, which is a several hundred pound animal, it can cause a major safety concern and you can get hurt or even worse when that happens. So Mm -hmm. trying to find ways to, you know, mitigate the fragmentation or to, allow animals to cross in areas on roads where they couldn't cross before safely or those animals that are getting hit providing opportunity for them to cross safely is what we do to try to solve some of those issues is through wildlife crossings and other methods. I know that uh, wildlife on roadways has been a problem since before I learned to drive. Looking back, when when did we first start doing something about it to have have less collisions on the road and and, and make the roadways safer for people. Right. So as you mentioned, we've, we've all kind of known it's a problem. As you, you grow up and drive roads, you, you see a lot of dead animals on the road, or you might hit an animal yourself, or you know someone that's hit an animal. So we know it's a problem, and it's, it's always been a problem. As far as what to do about it, a lot of the work that we did here in Arizona to start really trying to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions and address habitat fragmentation was uh, started in the 1990s, some of the planning for projects like Arizona State Route 260. Arizona State Route 260, just east of Payson, Arizona, has a stretch of road that was one of the highest elk vehicle collision areas in the state. And so when ADOT went to rebuild that road, there was a need to address those collisions and make it a safer road. So as they were rebuilding it, Wildlife crossings, in this case wildlife underpasses where the animals go under the road, were put in place. In fact, there are 17 crossings within 17 miles of road on State Route 260 east of Payson. Oh, so that's going from Payson and Star Valley all the way up to the top of the rim? Yeah, it really starts at Star Valley and then goes to the top of the rim. The stuff just out of Star Valley still needs to be constructed, but as you get further east, um, you'll start to see some fence come into place and then there's a bunch of crossings from there they're on in fact um the the 17 wildlife crossings where we have where the fencing ends there's a area we call the elk crosswalk 
which some people that drive up to the muggy on rim they'll see the signs that say you know caution elk detected ahead or Mm -hmm. um test area that's that's the elk crosswalk and that that's an animal detection system that uses thermal imaging to detect animals Mm. and when those animals are detected it'll turn on signs to let motorists know that there are animals crossing the road so that they can slow down and that that has been a very successful project in fact it's one of the most successful detection systems in the world and it's been in place since 2007 wow that's that's great yeah so so that that project on uh, steer out 260 we really started monitoring those wildlife crossings as they went in in the early 2000s and it was so long ago that we used vcrs to monitor them so hmm. we set up cameras with basically electronic you know garage door um you know brake beams and we were able to as animals came into the wildlife crossings we were able to see how they reacted to each of those wildlife crossings and we use that information to make recommendations and decisions for future wildlife crossing so really kind of cutting edge stuff back then right and we also used uh gps collars that was some of the first gps collars used in the state were on state route 260 we'd put collars on elk and they would tell us where they were going every two hours we'd get a location so then we could kind of connect the dots and say this is where those animals are crossing and we were able to make recommendations for the, where we put the fencing and and we use those techniques still to place wildlife crossings and fencings today we use the G- gps movement data so that was a very successful project state route 260 reduced collisions with elk by over 90 percent for the most part and it continues to be a good project today there's a little bit more to be done there but it's it's most of that's been been completed so that's really where we kind of started you know being able to learn and do things about wildlife vehicle collision and habitat fragmentation mitigation. Right. Okay. I, well, I remember looking back the first time I ever learned about wildlife crossings was on my way to Vegas, looking at what I saw as as overpasses to nowhere. I thought there can't be that much planned community out here to have overpasses made well in advance of of uh, you know um, housing or something going in. Who's going to live out here? And it wasn't until I started working at the department that I learned, okay, those aren't for people. That's for wildlife. You know, you'd mentioned fragmented populations. I kind of think back to hearing about this herd of pronghorn that needed to be moved because somewhere in Prescott Valley, there was a bunch of communities popping up. And then all of a sudden, they found this population of pronghorn stuck in the middle with no way to get out or migrate or 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 do anything. So seeing that GPS caller data that I've seen in your presentations, you know, really opened my eyes to just how far elk and pronghorn and these animals move or want to move around the state. Right. Yeah, and, and the, the GPS data really helps us with the, with planning efforts and including the developments you're talking about you have to think a long time ahead to be able to sustain wildlife populations and you know you got to look at it at a landscape level like if you address um, connectivity or the ability of animals to move through a certain area in one location but you don't think about it down the road where there might be something else that can affect them then you kind of lose that so you have to think of it larger scale Interestingly, the bridges to know you, where you talked about, that project is along U.S. Highway 93, and it's up near Hoover Dam. And what we did for that project, working with ADOT, Park Service, BLM, various other uh, entities up there, is we were able to um, take GPS collars and put them on the bighorn sheep up there and let the bighorn sheep tell us where to put the crossings. And in that case, we used overpasses where animals go over the road. And the reason that we did that was we had a project along State Route 68 between Kingman and Laughlin. Mm-hmm. And that had, was underpasses for bighorn sheep. And we didn't have a lot of luck with, with bighorn sheep using those underpasses. They were kind of shied away from those underpasses. So on Highway 93, we proposed overpasses using that data to tell us where to put the overpasses. We also used the data, the GPS movement data, to decide where the high fencing was going to go to guide animals to those overpasses. And that ended up being a a very successful project. We 
ultimately we haven't had a collision with bighorn sheep in that stretch since 2014. Wow. Whereas prior to that, there were about 11 bighorn sheep per year killed. And so now it's an expanded four lane divided highway. We're seeing less collisions. We also saw a tenfold increase in the ability of bighorn sheep to cross the road based on the GPS movement data. So we've not only reduced the wildlife vehicle collisions by 100% in that case, we've also increased the ability of sheep to move across the landscape again. And when we uh, turned the cameras off, we also had cameras on that, those structures, we were at over 6,000 sheep crossings and they were just using it regularly by that point. So it was another one of those ADOT game and fish and other stakeholder partnerships that really helped us kind of learn from these projects as so we could take them forward to future projects as well as share those projects um, in our successes with other states so they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. In fact, hmm. we worked with Nevada Department of Transportation just across the river in an area called Boulder City Bypass Phase 2. Mm -hmm. If you drive across the river, there's an overpass there with the silhouettes of bighorn sheep on it. And that project is one that... Uh, Nevada Department of Transportation actually brought Arizona Game and Fish on board so that we could share our knowledge so that they would have a highly successful project. And on that project, it was a brand new highway through an area with a lot of sheep, and it included um, overpass and a bunch of very large underpasses. And that that project, since it was opened up several years ago, has not had a, a bighorn sheep vehicle collision. And it's had over 22,000 bighorn sheep crossings at the wildlife crossing. So, again, we were able to take what we learned and and help our partners in other areas. And we kind of collaborated in that way. So we all learned from each other for more success in that way. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. They're along I-11, isn't it? Yeah. So that's that's a portion of of Interstate 11. It's called Interstate 11 Boulder City Bypass Phase 2. And that's one one chunk of of I-11 that has been completed um, over on the Nevada side. Right, yeah. I, I drove over that or through that several years ago <laughs> and, and not realizing where I was because it was just something brand new and I thought, I haven't been here before. This doesn't look familiar. Yeah. But um, you know, had mentioned that the GPS data on, on the uh, bighorn sheep. I remember seeing uh, one of your presentations. I thought that, that told us that... Um, Bighorn sheep like to travel along the peaks or the the top of yeah, the they, ridges. Bighorn sheep are are high, highly vis, visual animal, and so they like to get up high where they can look down on things. And so they tend to travel ridges, the tops of ridges, so they can see down. And that's what the data told us. And you know, it, it's it's logical. Um, but that's that we were able to let, then take that to ADOT, and and there's no dispute when you have the data. It's not a hey, we know, we think sheep travel the tops of ridges, so let's put it there. It was like, here's the data, there's no dis, you know, no dispute, and then, then that helps them make those decisions as well. Right, makes complete sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That makes me wonder, you know, how has our view of wildlife corridors and wildlife connectivity changed since, since you started here? Yeah, so we knew that there was... Um, you know, issues with habitat fragmentation caused by roads. We knew there was, was um, you know, roadkill. Uh, a lot of animals get hit on the roads. And, mm -hmm. you know, and we knew that was all an issue. But one of the things that really kind of opened up our eyes a little bit more were the GPS collars. So um, we were able to put collars on animals and, and see, hey, these animals are doing things that we didn't know they were doing. You know, they'll, they'll make these long-range migrations, and we didn't know that they were going to go there. And so that allows us to go, wow, we need to protect this corridor, do work to protect this corridor. Or, you know, in the case of Arizona Game and Fish Department, we've actually been able to change the way we manage our hunts based on the understanding of where these animals travel to and from. So there's just a, a whole realm of, um, of learning since then. In fact, there's a, a, a relatively recent uh, secretarial, order, secretarial Order 3362, which was signed in 2018, and that's a Western big game winter range and migration uh, order. And basically what that looks at is, you know, where, where are their corridors, defining corridors 
for wildlife and, defi- and defining where their winter range is and looking at it from a connectivity level. And one of the things that came out of that is Arizona Game and Fish Department provided f- was provided funding through that process so that we could go out and identify more corridors through collaring animals and be able to say, hey, these are quarters we need to conserve. We've now learned about these and we need to conserve them. And then we're able to implement work in those corridors and there there are funding opportunities behind that effort. And so it's starting to really expand and thinking about migrations, you know, and, and there's our migrations in Arizona are generally different than like Wyoming. Wyoming has some really long range migrations. We have a few long range migrations. In fact, we have, you know, our, our San Francisco Peaks mule deer herd, mm-hmm. you know, those animals go up to 90 miles, um, but they're bound by the roads in the Grand Canyon, but they're a 90 mile migration that they make um, up and back oh boy. in some, some instances. So we have some pretty long range migrations and we're able to, um, you know, conserve those areas and and we've just learned a lot since i've you know started working with the department over 25 years ago so with the work you're doing and have done over the years how many crossings are we looking at across the state how many do we have so right now we have four overpasses or some people call them land bridges where animals can go over the road with and then we also have dozens of underpasses and the number of underpasses is you know it's hard to say because a lot of those are also you know areas where water might pass and we've turned them into underpasses so there's several dozen underpasses for wildlife to go under the road it just depends on you know what part of the state you're looking at and how it's implemented there are a few of those that i learned were game and fish projects that i i had wondered why did they change this? On the way to Wikiup, there was a part of the road that went down over a wash and back up again. And, you know, after some major construction, there's a huge bridge there. And I thought, why did they go through all this effort to, to raise this up above that wash? That wash is not so big. And then I I learned, oh, that was us. <laughs> yeah, so so in areas where, where they can put in bridges... It helps ADOT and game and fish because it, it does allow for large water flows, you know, and, but it also allows for wildlife to use those structures when, when those are in place as well. Right, right. These structures, uh, certainly I, I can see more of them in our future. Now, we have some news about some more land bridges that might be happening uh, sometime soon. What, what What's happening with that? So recently... Arizona Game and Fish Department worked with ADOT to apply for funding for a wildlife overpass on Interstate 17. And we were awarded that grant through the Wildlife Crossing Pilot Program. And it's a $24 million grant, which allows us to put a crossing in. You know, elk is the target on this stretch of road because it's such a big safety concern. And so that's where where ADOT also had the buy-in. It was, a, it was mutually beneficial that this area would be a good place to focus our, our efforts. And then the Forest Service, being the surrounding landowner, uh, also was, you know, he's a partner in this and supportive. So having all three of those come together to where, you know, everybody, it's a win-win for everybody. And so we were awarded this funding and we've been working with ADOT on the design of this wildlife crossing for over a year now, along with a couple other um, overpasses, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this particular one, we applied for a grant. There was a $111 million available this year to all of the states to apply for. And we were able to get 24 million of that here in Arizona for that project. So it was, it was a successful grant and we're hoping to be able to break ground on that in the next couple of years and start to put in, in these, uh, this crossing, that particular area, I-17 itself, we see a hundred elk and deer a year killed, um, between an area called Stoneman Lake and Flagstaff. So it's, it's a really, you know, dangerous road to drive but we also see a lot of animals that can't get across the road they're based on our gps data so you know being able to get this grant is a step in the right direction and and as you know when we applied for that grant we had a lot of support 
You know, we got letters of support from multiple entities, including some of our NGO partners like Mule Deer Foundation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Arizona Elk Society, Arizona Wildlife Federation, Wildlands Network, you know, to name a few. And then some of the local um, government grant, you know, letters that we got included like Coconino County Board of Supervisors, the City of Flagstaff in Sedona, our local Forest Service, and for that matter, the Regional Forest Service. And that went up to letters of support from from our governor and the senators also so we were able to get a lot of support behind this from a lot of partners and it's something that a lot of a lot of folks believe in and i think that's really what kind of carried it across the finish line to be able to get funding for this this project and that is one of our priority overpasses for the department The department has three areas where we're focusing our priorities on right now for wildlife crossings. Um, One of the areas is I-17, which we got the grant for, for the $24 million. There's also going to be on I-17, we're focusing on another overpass that is just south of Kachina Village um, on I-17 also. So there'll be two overpasses on I-17 if we're able to get funding for those. There's also um, an overpass on I-40 west of Parks we're focusing on. Um, also, that particular area, we have not have seen a high level of elk and deer collisions. And our GPS movement data and um, collision data point to an area at milepost 174 roughly on I-40 west of Flagstaff. Mm-hmm. And that'll be an overpass um, also that is one of our priorities. And interesting on that one is it's not just a safety. Not as, There's also issues with pronghorn in that area. So we have pronghorn. They're not getting hit on the road, but they just can't get across the road. They're, um, they're, the animals that we've put collars on on the north side of I-40 and the animals that we put collars on on the south side of I-40, they've never interacted with each other. They just can't get there because the traffic volumes are so high on I-40. Doesn't the, the data show them approaching the, the uh, highway and then just stopping? Yeah. Both, uh, on both sides. Right. Trying to go north, trying to go south, and then they just don't do it. Yeah, it's, it's a complete barrier, and, and it's been that way for decades. And in fact, we found that pronghorn in northern Arizona actually have genetic issues with roads like there will be genetically different populations on different sides of roads even some of the lower traffic volume roads they just they don't handle roads and fences very well Mm -hmm. you know and so we see some issues there and so that that project or the overpass on i-40 will also connect a pronghorn herd that hasn't been connected in decades and so that'll provide movement Right now, we have animals that move from the Grand Canyon down to I-40, and we have animals that move from I-40 down to Prescott. Mm -hmm. So we'll have animals that can, in theory, move from Grand Canyon to Prescott. So we've increased that migration that they can have, and it's going to make for a more resilient population. And the last area that's it's a priority for Game and Fish is is the wrapping up the State Route 260 project, an area called Lion Springs. And we've been working with ADOT. It's where the Elk Crosswalk was that I was talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. that, you know, rather than having animals come around the end of the fence at a crosswalk, we're working with ADOT to put in another overpass and some underpasses, and they have that in their planning efforts right now. So we hope to see that in the near future as well. Ah, okay. So it's constantly developing. Yeah, constantly developing. And, you know, that's just... That's just a real short list of, of fires when it comes to connectivity. I mean, there the number of places that need wildlife crossings, you can't count. I mean, it's it's immeasurable and because just about every road out there needs a wildlife crossing somewhere along it, you know, and and needs some sort of mitigation. It's just you gotta start somewhere and that's that's where our you know, some of these interstates are some of the biggest barriers to wildlife. And also, you know, when, when people hit an animal at 75, 80 miles an hour, that's, that's a real problem. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where, where we're focusing our efforts right now is trying to address some of that stuff. So with all that uh, work that's happening on I-17, there's some more news about a grant that we got. Yeah, so we got another grant through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, America the Beautiful Program. And we were able to compete for those funds 
for I-17 fencing, which is south of uh, Munns Park, between Woods, Woods Canyon and Munns Park, that fencing went into place in 2011. It was a raised right-of-way fence mainly focused on keeping elk off the road, and it worked really well. We mm-hmm. actually reduced elk vehicle collisions by 98% on that stretch of road, and that fencing ties into two large bridges that are meant for water flow that guides animals to those bridges. So elk and other wildlife would go underneath. We had cameras on those structures and we saw a 100% increase in use of those structures by wildlife. So we not only saw the collisions reduce, but we also saw that the animals were using the structures. Now that fence was meant for elk and a lot of other animals can get through it and it's starting to degrade over time. And so we put in for a grant with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to upgrade that fence to a woven wire fence, which we use um, elsewhere, like along State Route 260 and U.S. Highway 93, to be able to keep other wildlife off the road, but also make it a more robust fence. And we were awarded uh, $1 million from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for that grant. And that that fencing will actually be tacked onto the south end of the larger grant with the Willard Springs project. So it'll make that stretch all the way from Woods Canyon all the way up to Kelly Canyon. If you're familiar with the area, we'll have fence and opportunities for wildlife to cross. So it'll make it a safer area as well. Very nice. You know, Game of Fish really doesn't work in a bubble. We have all these partners that we, we work with, you know, from, from federal agencies, all the way down to, to cities and counties, you must work with a lot of folks. Yeah, so, you know, connectivity across Arizona, it's it's something that, that game and fish can't do by themselves. We have to work with a lot of different entities to be able to make some of these projects happen or to just plan to be able to not cause more problems for wildlife. And so the ability of other agencies and entities to work with us is key. And, and, you know, working, for example, working with, you know, the forest service on, on connectivity, you know, across the forest, they, they have plans to be able to, you know, try to keep corridors open. In fact, we work, work with a group called Northern Arizona Landscape Connectivity Alliance. They are a three forest program that's trying to address wildlife connectivity across those three forests. And so they use our data to help guide some of their planning. And then we work with them to be able to implement, like say grassland restoration for pronghorn or quarter restoration for, for mule deer. Um, you know, so it's just one example, but we'll work with uh, groups like the town of Buckeye. They, you know, on, on connectivity, you know, across across the town of Buckeye, including like we're working on areas like discussing areas between the White Tank Mountains and the Belmont Mountains west of town and how to keep movement through that area. And I mean, and that's just got numerous partners everywhere from the town to the flood control district to the developers. It's just on and on. There's, there's so many groups that need to be involved. And then also just working with our local, you know, with our NGOs on, on projects, they're, they're, great advocates for us and we're able to get a lot done with their their help it's just there's the, the number of partners is endless and and we can't do it without without them well jeff thank you for being here i really appreciate it so keep up the good work you know keeping our wildlife safe keeping our people safe and and working with other people in the state other agencies to to make this work who do you who would you thank yeah well, one of the the first uh, groups I want to thank is ADOT for working with us so closely on wildlife and roads. Our partnership with ADOT has grown over the past several years as we've had successes and, and our ability to work with ADOT actually helped us to get this larger grant. They were on board and li- to listening to us and working with us and being able to apply. And they're, they're the lead agency on this now. And that's, that's a, a long that's a big step in the right direction for wildlife in Arizona when ADOT's able to partner with us. And, but we also work with multiple other partners across the state from the NGOs to the federal agencies, state agencies, and Arizona Game and Fish Department could not address uh, connectivity alone, and we need everybody's help to do that. All right. Well, thank you once again, and uh, we got to do this again sometime. Thank you, Ben. appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Visit us online at www.azgfd.gov.